This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2021. Lesson one from the series Rest in Christ is titled Living in a 24-7 Society, ready for teaching on July 3, and I'm Percy Harold. An introduction to our lessons for this quarter is titled Rest for the Restless. And it's written by the authors of this quarter's lessons, Chantel and Gerald Klingbell, who enjoy a cross-cultural marriage and working as a team. Chantel, an Associate Director of the LNG White Estate, hails from South Africa, while Gerald, an Associate Editor of Adventist Review Ministries and Research Professor of Old Testament and Ancient Near Eastern Studies at Andrews University, was born and raised in Germany. They begin... The flight had been uneventful until the moment the captain announced from the flight deck that the plane would have to cross a major storm. Please tighten your seatbelts. We will be in for quite a ride, the voice from the cockpit said in ending the announcement. Soon after, the plane began to shake violently as it fought its way through the storm. Overhead bins opened, people sat tense in their seats. After a particularly violent shudder of the plane, someone shrieked in the back of the plane. Images of a wing breaking off and the plane careening to the earth flashed through a few minds. All passengers looked tense and fearful, all except a little girl seated in the front row of economy. She was busy drawing a picture on the open tray table before her. Now and again she would look out the small window of a particularly impressive lightning strike, but then she would calmly resume her drawing. After what seemed half an eternity, the plane finally landed at its destination. Passengers cheered and clapped, so grateful and relieved to be back on the ground. The little girl had packed her bag and was waiting for people to leave the plane when one of the travellers asked her if she hadn't been afraid. How could she be that calm during a major storm and with the plane shaking so much? I wasn't scared, the little girl said to the surprised man. My dad is the pilot and I knew he was taking me home. Restlessness and fear often go hand in hand. Living in a world that keeps most people busy 24-7 can result in restlessness and fear in our lives. Who doesn't at times struggle with fear, with worry and with dread of what the future holds? The past is done, the present is now, but the future is full of questions and in this unstable world the answers might be not what we want to hear. We wonder if we might be able to make a looming deadline to cover the next rent or school payment or to make our struggling marriages survive another storm. We wonder if God can continue to love us even though we disappoint Him again and again. In this quarter, we will tackle some of those fears head on. Rest in Christ, the title for this quarter, is not just a title for a study guide or the captivating logo of an evangelistic campaign or camp meeting. Resting in Christ is the key to the type of life that Jesus promises his followers. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10.10 As the authors worked on this study guide, they suddenly realised the all-pervasiveness of the concept of rest in the texture of biblical theology. Rest connects to salvation, to grace, to creation, to the Sabbath, to our understanding of the state of the dead, to the soon coming of Jesus, and so much more. When Jesus invited us to come and find rest in him in Matthew 11.28, he not only addressed his disciples or the early Christian church, he also saw future generations of sin-sick, weary, worn-out, struggling human beings who needed access to the source of rest. As you study the weekly lessons during this quarter, remember to come and rest in him. After all, Our Heavenly Father is in control and is ready to bring us home safely. (music) 
Sabbath afternoon, June 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we live in a busy, busy, busy world. We also live in a time when we are distracted in so many ways and we are separated from each other on so many occasions. Lord, we just pray that as we open your word this week, that we may find rest, that we may find solace, that we may find comfort in knowing that you are the one behind all things, the one who, with your mighty arms, stretch out to protect and guide each of us. And as people listen from Barbados to Berlin, from South Africa to Canada, and from Portugal to Port of Spain, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be there to bless and guide each of us in our humble abodes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 84 and verse 2. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Let's read that again, Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Tick-tock, 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 tick-tock. The clock ticked steadily and mercilessly. Over two hours before Sabbath would begin, Mary sighed as she surveyed the small apartment. The kids' toys were still lying all around the living room. The kitchen was a mess. Sarah, their youngest, lay in bed with a fever. And tomorrow Mary had agreed to serve as a greeter in their church, which meant that they had to leave home thirty minutes before the normal time. I wish I could find some quietness tomorrow, Mary thought wistfully. At the same time, on the other side of town, Josh, Mary's husband, was standing in line to pay for their weekly groceries. Traffic had again been a nightmare. The checkout lines were long. Everyone seemed to be doing their shopping right at that moment. I need some rest. I can't go on like this, Josh groaned inwardly. There must be more to this life. Our lives are governed by rush hours, work hours, medical appointments, virtual conversations, shopping and school functions. Whether we use public transport, ride a small scooter or steer a minivan to ferry around our families, the drumbeat of constant engagement with the world around us threatens to drown out what's really important. How do we find rest amid so much hustle and bustle? Sunday, June 27. Worn and weary. Question. Read Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Why would God create a rest day before anyone was even tired? Genesis 2, beginning at verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Even before we humans would dash off on our self-imposed stressful lives, God established a marker, a living way to jog our memory. This day would be a time to stop and deliberately enjoy life, a day to be and not to do, a day to especially celebrate the gift of grass, air, wildlife, water, people, and most of all, the creator of every good gift. This was no one-time invitation that expired with the exile from Eden. God wanted to make sure that the invitation would stand the test of time. And so right from the beginning, he knit the Sabbath rest into the very fabric of time. There would always be the invitation, again and again, to a restful celebration of creation every seventh day. 
One would think that, with all our labour-saving devices, that we should be less physically tired than people were 200 years ago. But actually, rest seems to be in short supply even today. Even the moments that we aren't working are spent in frantic activity. It always seems that we are somehow behind. No matter how much we manage to get done, there is always more to do. Research shows, too, that we are getting less sleep and many people are highly dependent on caffeine to keep going. Though we have faster cell phones, faster computers, faster internet connections, we still never seem to have enough time. Question, what do the following texts teach about why our having rest is important? First of all, Mark chapter 6 and verse 31. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. And Psalm 4 verse 8. I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. And Exodus chapter 23, verse 12. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female servant and the stranger may be refreshed. And Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 14. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The God who created us knew that we would need physical rest. He built cycles into time, night and Sabbath, to offer us a chance for physical rest. Acknowledging Jesus as the Lord of our lives also involves taking seriously our responsibility to make time to rest. After all, the Sabbath commandment isn't merely a suggestion, it is a commandment. So to finish the day, what about your own harried experience? What can you do to better experience, both physically and spiritually, the rest that God wants us to have? Monday, June 28, Running on Empty Lack of sleep and exhaustion because of physical overexertion are real problems. More troubling, however, are the times we feel that we are running on emotional empty. And of course, when lack of sleep is added to emotional trials, we can become painfully discouraged. Barak, Jeremiah's scribe, must have felt like that often during the last turbulent years of Jerusalem, prior to the chaos, suffering and havoc that would follow the city's destruction by the Babylonians. Question, read Jeremiah 45, verses 1 to 5. Write a quick diagnosis of Barak's emotional health. Jeremiah 45, beginning at verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Barak, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the instruction of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Barak. You said, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built I will break down, and what I have planted I will pluck up. That is, this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord, but I will give your life to you as a prize in all places 
wherever you go. Can you imagine what it would feel like if God sent a custom-made message to you personally? Barak received a message straight from God's throne room. Jeremiah 45 verse 2 we've just read. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Barak. We are told that this happened in the fourth year of Jehoiakim of Judah, about 605 or 604 BC. Jeremiah 45 3 represents a good summary of how people feel when they are running on empty. You said, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow, and I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. From all that we know in Scripture about this period, it's clear that Barak's complaints were not superficial wails. He had good reasons to feel discouraged and emotionally worn out. A lot of bad things were happening, and more were to come. Question, how does God respond to Barak's aches and pains? Let's look at verses 4 and 5 again of chapter 45. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, what I have built I will break down, and what I have planted I will pluck up. That is this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. God's response to Barak's real pain reminds us of the fact that God's despair and pain must have been exponentially so much bigger than Barak's. He had built Jerusalem. He was about to tear it down. He had planted Israel as a vineyard, as we read in Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 7. He was about to uproot it and carry it into exile. Isaiah 5, beginning at verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved, song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a winepress in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. This was not what the Lord had wanted for his people, but it had to come because of their rebellion against him. But there was light at the end of the tunnel for Barak. God would preserve Barak's life even in the midst of destruction, exile and loss. And so to finish today, read again the words of God directed to Barak. What general message can we take from them for ourselves? That is, what does it say about God ultimately being there for us, regardless of our situation? Tuesday, June 29, Defining Rest in the Old Testament Certainly we all need rest, which is why it's a theme found all through the Bible. Though God created us for activity, that activity is to be punctuated by rest. The Hebrew Old Testament, for instance, includes a number of terms denoting rest. The description of God's resting on the newly created seventh day in Genesis 2, 2 and 3 uses the verb Shabbat to cease work, 
to rest, to take a holiday, which is the verb form of the noun Sabbath. We read the text, Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The same verb is used in Exodus 5.5 5, in a causative form and translated as making someone rest from their work. Exodus 5.5 5, And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labour. Angry Pharaoh accuses Moses of making them rest from their labour. The reference to God's resting activity on the seventh day Sabbath in the fourth commandment is expressed by the Hebrew verb form nuach, N U A K H, as in Exodus 20, verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it, and in Deuteronomy 5.14 But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, in it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. The verb is translated as rest in Job 3.13, or more figuratively, settled, referencing the Ark of the Covenant in Numbers 10.36. Job 3.13 reads, For now I would have lain still and been quiet, I would have been asleep, then I would have been at rest. Numbers 10 verse 36 reads, And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. Second Kings 2.15 notes that Elijah's spirit rested on Elisha. And we read that in Second Kings 2.15. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Another important verb form is shakat, S-H-A-Q-A-T, to be at rest, grant relief, be quiet. It is used in Joshua 11.23, where it describes the rest of the land from war after Joshua's initial conquest. So Joshua took the whole land, according to all that the Lord had said to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their divisions by their tribes. Then the land rested from war. The term often appears to indicate peace in the books of Joshua and Judges. The term raga, R-A-G-A, also is used to indicate rest. In the warnings against disobedience in Deuteronomy, God tells Israel that they won't find rest in exile in Deuteronomy 28.65. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. The same verb also appears in a causative form in Jeremiah 50 verse 34, describing the inability to rest. And that reads, Their Redeemer is strong, the Lord of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their case that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. Question, read Deuteronomy 31.16 and 2 Samuel 7.12. What kind of rest is being talked about here? Deuteronomy 31.16 And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the foreigners of the land, where they go to be among them. And they will forsake me and break my commandment, which I have made with them. And Second Samuel 7 and verse 12 When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Both verses use an idiomatic expression from the verb shakab, S-H-A-K-A-B, which literally means to lie down sleep.
In God's covenant with David, God promises the future king of Israel that when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you in 2 Samuel 7 verse 12. The long and here incomplete list of different Hebrew verbs denoting rest helps us to understand that the theological concept of rest is not connected to one or two particular words. We rest individually and collectively. Rest affects us physically, socially and emotionally and is not limited to the Sabbath alone. And so to finish the day, death is certainly an enemy and will one day be abolished. And, however much we mourn and miss our dead, why is it comforting to know that, at least for now, they are at rest? Wednesday, June 30. Rest in the New Testament. A verb form for rest often found in the New Testament is anapau, A-N-A-P-A-U-O, to rest, relax or refresh. It is used in one of Jesus' most famous statements on rest in Matthew 11:28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It can refer to physical rest, as we read in Matthew 26 and verse 45. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. In the final greetings to the Corinthians, Paul expresses his joy over the arrival of friends who refreshed his spirit, as we read in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 18, For they refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. Another verb used to indicate rest is hesychazo, H-E-S-Y-C-H-A-Z-O. It describes the Sabbath rest of the disciples as Jesus rested in the grave, as we read in Luke 23, 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. But it also is used to describe living a quiet life. First Thessalonians 4.11 That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And can indicate that someone has no objections and thus keeps quiet. As in Acts 11.18 When they heard these things they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. When the epistle to the Hebrews in Hebrews 4.4 describes God's creation rest on the seventh day, it uses the Greek verb katapau, K-A-T-A-P-A-U-O, to cause to cease, bring to rest, or rest echoing the use of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Hebrews 4.4 reads, For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Intriguingly, most of the use of this verb in the New Testament occurs in Hebrews 4. Question, read Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 32. Why did Jesus tell his disciples to come aside and rest, considering the many mission opportunities they then had? Look at the larger context of Mark 6 as you think about this question. Mark six thirty to 32 Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Come aside by yourselves and rest a while, we read in verse 31, is not framed as an invitation. It's expressed in the form of an imperative, which is an order or a command. 
Jesus is concerned about his disciples and their physical and emotional well-being. They had just returned from an extensive mission trip on which Jesus had sent them two by two, as we read in verse 7. And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Mark 6.30 describes their excited return. Their hearts must have been full. They wanted to share their victories and their failures with Jesus, yet Jesus stops it all by first calling them to rest. Mark includes an explanatory note. For there are many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat, in verse 31. Being overwhelmed and too busy in God's business was a genuine challenge for the disciples as well. Jesus reminds us that we need to guard our health and emotional well-being by planning in seasons of rest. And so to finish today, what are ways of helping and relieving your local church pastor or elder or anyone you know who could be burned out from doing the Lord's work? What could you do to express your appreciation and help this person find rest? Thursday, July 1. A Restless Wanderer. Read Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. What made Cain a restless wanderer? As we read in Genesis 4, 12 in the New International Version, on the earth. Well, we'll read the whole text here from uh, the New King James Version, and it reads like this. Genesis 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. The biblical text does not explicitly state why God respected Abel and his offering, but did not respect Cain and his offering. Verses 4 and 5, let's read those again. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. But we know why. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 72, Cain came before God with murmuring and infidelity in his heart in regard to the promised sacrifice and the necessity of the sacrificial offerings. His gift expressed no penitence for sin. He felt, as many now feel, that it would be an acknowledgement of weakness to follow the exact plan marked out by God, of trusting his salvation wholly to the atonement of the promised Saviour. He chose the course of self-dependence. He would come in his own merits, end of quote. When God said that Cain would be a restless wanderer on the earth, it wasn't that God made him that way. Rather, that is what happened as the result of his sinful actions and disobedience. Not finding rest in God, Cain discovered that he couldn't find it any other way, at least not true rest. 
The Hebrew word translated as respected in verse 4 also could be rendered looked closely or considered carefully. The focus of God's careful and close-up look is not so much the offering, but more the attitude of the offerer. God's rejection of Cain's fruit offering is not the arbitrary reaction of a capricious God. Rather, it describes the process of carefully considering and weighing the character, attitudes and motivations of the one bringing the offering. It is a good example of an investigative judgment. Question, read Genesis 4, verses 13 to 17, and describe Cain's reaction to God's judgment. Genesis 4, beginning at verse 13, And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest any one finding him should kill him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. When we try to run away from God's presence, we become restless. We try to fill the yearning for divine grace with things, human relationships or overly busy lives. Cain started to build a dynasty and a city. Both are great achievements and speak of determination and energy. But if it's a godless dynasty and a rebellious city, it will ultimately amount to nothing. And so to finish the day... Even if we end up suffering the consequences of our sins, as we usually do, how can we learn to accept the forgiveness for them offered us through the cross? Friday, July 2. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 362, we read, In the estimation of the rabbis, it was the sum of religion to be always in a bustle of activity. They depended upon some outward performance to show their superior piety. Thus, they separated their souls from God and built themselves up in self-sufficiency. The same dangers still exist. As activity increases and men become more successful in doing any work for God, there is danger of trusting to human plans and methods. There is a tendency to pray less and to have less faith. Like the disciples, we are in danger of losing sight of our dependence on God and seeking to make a saviour of our activity. We need to look constantly to Jesus, realising that it is His power which does the work. While we are to labour earnestly for the salvation of the lost, we must also take time for meditation, for prayer, and for the study of the Word of God. Only the work accomplished through much prayer and sanctified by the merit of Christ will, in the end, prove to have been efficient for good. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, the constant pressure of being on top of things, being available physically or virtually all the time, and trying to live up to ideals that are neither realistic nor God-given can make people sick emotionally, physically and spiritually. How can your church become a welcoming place for worn-out, tired people yearning for rest? Two, Is it possible that we are too busy even doing good things for God? Think about the story of Jesus and his disciples in Mark 6, verses 30 to 32, and discuss its applications in your Sabbath school group. Chapter 6 of Mark, beginning at verse 30, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat, 
by themselves. 3. In 1899, a speed record had been broken. Someone had actually gone 39.24 miles per hour in a car and lived to tell about it. Today, of course, cars go much faster than that, and the speed of the processors in our cell phones are much faster than the fastest large computers of a generation ago. And air travel is faster than it used to be, and is getting even faster. The point is that almost everything we do today is done faster than it was in the past, and yet what? We still feel hurried and without enough rest. What should that tell us about basic human nature and why God would have made rest so important that it is one of his commandments. And four, dwell more on the idea that even in Eden, before sin, the Sabbath rest had been instituted. Besides the interesting theological implication of this truth, what should this tell us about how rest was needed even in a sinless, perfect world? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Flip Flops and Fights, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Everything seemed strange to six year old Danae when he arrived in the United States with his father, mother, and six older siblings. Cars filled the streets of their new hometown. Danae hadn't seen many cars in the refugee camp in Thailand where his family had lived after fleeing violence in their native Myanmar. Before, the family had lived in a bamboo home without air conditioning and running water, and Danae had bathed in a river. Now everything was in the house. Danae thanked God for the new home. Danae arrived at public school wearing flip-flops, and the teacher immediately sent him home. The staff member who drove him home told his mother how to find the shoe store. But neither of his parents could drive or speak English. So a relative took him to the store to buy his first pair of shoes. Danae returned to school the next day, but it was a difficult year. Some children treated refugees unkindly, and one of his brothers got into fights. Then a Seventh-day Adventist befriended the family and helped Danae transfer to a church school for second grade. Scholarship funds from a 13th Sabbath offering helped cover his tuition. Danae was happy to be in the church school with kind and friendly classmates. He had heard about God from his Christian parents at home, but now he was reading the Bible for himself at school. He wanted to learn more, and as he grew older, he joined various Bible study groups. His faith came to the test when he was 12. One day, his father collapsed outside the house after working in the garden. No one knew how to call the ambulance, so family members lifted him into a car and rushed him to the hospital. Danae was devastated. That night, he tossed and turned. He prayed like never before. God, please help my dad to recover. And he said, If he does recover, I will get baptised and devote myself to you. Three days later, he saw his father in the hospital. The once strong man looked pale and frail. The physician said he had suffered a stroke. Danae continued to pray. Weeks passed and his father slowly improved. When he came home, Danae made good on his promise to God. He was baptised. His father died of cancer five years later, but Danae, 17, is glad that he gave his heart to Jesus. After getting baptised, I began to read the Bible more, pray more, and talk to God more, he said. The more I did these things, the happier I felt. God is always watching, and he is always going to be there for me. I always feel thankful. A 2011 13 Sabbath offering helped refugee children like Danae receive study in Adventist schools in the North American Division. Part of this quarter's offering will again help refugee children obtain an Adventist education in North America. Thank you for planning a generous offering. 
This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.